Hello everyone, welcome back to the third and final video on the Cold Pitch Oscillator. This time we're going to be using crystals in our circuit to create the oscillating frequencies and we'll be designing the circuit using a transistor. So we'll come up with the design criteria needed to get this to oscillate on frequency and go through some of the theory of the operation for this circuit. We're not going to go too much into crystal theory, that's videos all unto themselves, but we will talk about how we're going to get the gain out of the circuit that we're going to need. And we'll also be looking at a circuit created by a ham radio operator, G3PTO. And this circuit is a way to test a wide range of crystals to see what their oscillating frequency is. So just plug whatever crystal is you want and you should get the frequency out within a few, a few kilohertz. It's not going to be a very precise circuit, it's just a, a little test jig. So if you have a whole bunch of crystals in your, in your bench and you don't know what specific values they are, just plug them in here and it'll give you the output. We're also going to test both of these circuits, the precise one here and the general test circuit on the previous side, on the breadboard and see how they operate and if they agree with the theory of operation that we that we develop. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll start by looking at the DC parameters of our circuit and identifying what kind of a circuit we have. So if you look at this, we can see that we have an output on the emitter and an input on the base, nothing on the collector. So this identifies the circuit as a, as a common collector or an emitter follower. Now the characteristics of an emitter follower or common collector are that it's a perfect buffer, which means that it has a high input impedance and that the output impedance is low, so we have low Z out. Another thing that makes this circuit or this configuration particularly useful is that the output and the input have no phase shift. We need to get that regenerative feedback to get the circuit to oscillate and you can only get regenerative feedback if there is no phase shift so we don't have a phase shifting network that we have to worry about like some of the other circuits. So V out and V in are in phase so this is a, an excellent circuit to use for that. When we're using a common collector or an emitter follower, we want to get the most compliance out of the circuit that we can. Compliance just being a, a term that tells us that if we have a load line like this, we want to be able to go up and down that load line as far as we can. The more compliance we have, the better off we are. So that you know that cutoff is going to be 10 volts and saturation is going to be somewhere around 5 vo or 0 volts so the midpoint we're looking for is about 5 points 5 volts so we have 5 volts then at the output if this is a typical transistor we're going to have about 5.6 to 5.7 volts vn so we have to come up with some set of resistors that are going to give us that 5.7 volts in. A simple way that I found to get any resistor values for a, a transistor is by imagining that I always have 10 volts and you can change the voltages when you need to but you start with 10 volts. So let's say that I didn't know that a 62 and an 82k ohm resistor would work and I but I do know that if I had 5.7k ohms on RB2 and I have 4.3k ohms on RB1 this is going to give me a voltage divider the voltage is going to divide proportionally across this it's 10 volts and I would get my 5.7 volts what I can do is just come up with a ratio between 4.3k and 5.7k so 4.3 and 5.7 I don't even need the K and if I divide one into the other, the ratio between the two is going to be 0 0.754. What this will give me is if I select a resistor here, the one on top has to be 0.754, the same size. So if I have 10K on this one, I could have 700 or 7.54K on this one. It'll work just as well if I had 
12 volts then of course I would want to have 6.7 volts here and the ratios would work out just the same so it's a really simple way of of getting a base voltage so in this case I selected an 82k ohm resistor first and then multiplying that by 0.754 came out to a value just under 62k so I'm going to end up with something slightly higher or slightly lower than the the 5.7 volts but it's been going to be close enough that I'm not even going to worry about it it's going to be almost perfectly centered on the load line for this particular circuit because it is a common collector and we are trying to make sure that the impedance is high as seen by the crystal we don't want to load the crystal down we have to have high value resistors for RB1 and RB2 so we want to get these as high as we can, but we don't want to make them so large that they start starving the transistor of any current and make the circuit vary at the output current wise. So a, a reasonable compromise is a 62 and 82K. I wouldn't want to use anything excessively larger than this. And that again, that's because, well, beta is a variable. It changes with temperature. And if I make these too small then I get too much loading and if I make them too large I can get too much uh, current variation that can make this really sensitive to those changes so let's compute a few values on our circuit and determine how it's operating right now now that I've settled on the resistors that I'm going to use here I have to determine the resistor that I'm going to use on the emitter and since I'm looking at about 5 volts at the output, again, I haven't computed that, but we'll do that in just a second. 5 volts divided by 4.7K is going to give me just over 1 milliamp, and that's going to give me a transconductance that is going to work well for this particular circuit. A transconductance of around 35 or, or 40 millisiemens. So to find my first DC value, I need to find the voltage on the base of this transistor. And that is determined by the values of RB2 over RB1 plus RB2 times VCC and just plugging in our numbers so we have what uh, 82k divided by 62 plus 82k times 10 volts we get 5.694 volts on the base if we assume that the emitter to base junction is going to drop approximately 7 tenths of a volt and we should end up on the emitter with a voltage of 4.994. And to get the current, we just have 4.994 volts on the emitter divided by the 4.7k ohms of RE. And we have a current of 1.063 milliamps. Well, we need this to get the transconductance of our circuit because the transconductance is going to determine some of the characteristics that we need to make sure we meet for the transistor or the crystal to operate. So typically we use 26 millivolts as a thermal voltage and that thermal voltage is just the random noise at room temperature that that junction is going to have and we're going to divide it by 1.063 milliamps so it's going to be the thermal voltage divided by IE you might see this if you're more familiar with from the the technician standpoint as it'll be flipped around actually it would just be 26 millivolts divided by IE and that would give you the value of R prime E so it's pretty much the same thing it's just two different ways of looking at the same equation so 26 millivolts divided by the 1.063 milliamps is going to give us a transconductance of 0 0.0409 or 40.9 millisiemens. And that's pretty much all we need to know for how the circuit is biased for DC. Now if we look at the load line for the circuit, we would have, of course, our 10 volts for cutoff. We'd have some maximum for saturation and if we want to just figure that out we just have to look at well if both of these junctions go into forward bias the only thing we have left to limit the the current that's going through the circuit is our 4.7k 
And typically in saturation, most data sheets will tell you that there's about two tenths of a volt drop from the collector to the emitter. And if we plug it in, we get 9.8 divided by 47. And you can see our saturation is going to be about 2.085 milliamps. So about 2 milliamps up here. And we are right now operating at 1.063. So we're pretty much right in the middle of the load line because we have the 4.994 and that would put us right about there and as well as the 1.063 since this is what was it 2.085 0.85 milliamps and we had 1.063 so pretty close to the center of our load line which is going to give us the maximum compliance and that means that our crystal isn't going to saturate or going to cut off so let's plug in some numbers and analyze the AC part of this circuit. The next thing we want to do is select the capacitance value for C1. We do that by determining from the data sheet what the input capacitance is for our transistor and then multiplying that value by at least 10. The capacitance for a 4124 on the input is going to be 8 picofarad. So that's a pretty low capacitance. As a, a, a comparison, if we had a 2N2222, that would be 25 picofarad, so substantially larger. And using this 4124, we can get away with a much smaller capacitor, and that's better for the circuit overall. Having that 8 picofarad from base to emitter, and then selecting a value that's going to be 10 times larger than that. And you can see we already have 82 picofarad. Again, we just multiply by 10, get the 80 picofarad, and select the next value up. We do that because when we have capacitors that are in parallel, and that base to emitter capacitance does appear in parallel to C1, you'll recall that the total capacitance for this would appear to be about 90 picofarad which is only a small variation from the actual 82 picofarad so we swamp out that base to emitter capacitance by having a capacitor C1 that's going to be 10 times larger once we've selected our value for C1 in this case 82 picofarad we have to select the value for C2 C2 is going to determine the amount of feedback in the circuit and it's also going to determine the voltage out. If we look at the circuit broken down a little bit like this and for right now let's let's ignore V2 entirely and we exchange these capacitances uh, for reactances and let's give them all a value of of 10 ohms for XC1 and we'll also give 10 ohms to XC2. Because the crystal is in parallel to these two values, it's going to act as if it was an inductance. So that means that we should, at resonance, have 20 ohms in our imaginary circuit for, for XL. The 10 ohms here and the 10 ohms here is going to be balanced with the 20 ohms for XL. Now if we put a, a voltage in, and let's call it 1 volt, we're going to get a path that is going to go in this direction for C2. And of course we're going to get a current of 100 milliamps. For this part of the circuit, remember now that we have a path that's going to go in this direction to ground. So we have C1 in series with XL. And these are out of phase with one another, so they cancel each other out. So what I'm left with is 0 for XC, it's just gone, and XL becomes 10 ohms. And again, I have a current of well, the one volt is attached and it's going to go through our circuit and give us 100 milliamps. So that's at resonance. However, in 
any real circuit, practical circuit, we will have that current, but the ohm, ohmic values are going to stay. So now I have, again, going back, my 20 ohms, and I'm still going to have my 100 milliamps going through here. That means that there is now 2 volts on this part of the circuit. Well, that 2 volts now feeds back into the base. Now, notice what happened. I started out with 1 volt on my output, and I came out with 2 volts on the base. The circuit has done a bit of transformation in taking some of the, the current that goes through here and just transforming it to voltage. It's not amplifying it, it's just a transformation. And that's all caused by the impedances that are in the circuit. So we get our 1 volt in and we get our 2 volts out. Now notice that this gives us that criterion that we have to have a gain of greater than 1. In, in the circuit as it is, and let me go ahead and clean this up for just a second, one thing we know about a common collector is that there is no voltage gain on the circuit, but we do know that Vn is going to be approximately equal to V out. And that ratio really is going to be based on the value of R prime E, or the junction resistance between the base and the emitter. So to get the voltage out, and if we just look at this as a series circuit now with R prime E in the path, the voltage is only going to de be developed across R E, and the whole circuit is R prime E plus R E. So we have a simple voltage divider. So we can find the ratio at least of how much output we have versus input. So we had 4.7 K ohms over and R prime E in our circuit is going to be about 25 ohms plus 4.7 K ohms. And you can see how small a value this is. So we're approximately equal to 1. So there's no way just using the transistor that we're going to get the voltage gain we need to get positive feedback into the circuit to get it to oscillate. So we have to rely on the impedances and the transformation that goes on in this circuit that we just looked at. So with our 1 volt in, we found that we actually had 2 volts going back into the base, and that was the attenuation. So strangely enough, our attenuation in here gave us the necessary amplification, the attenuating circuit, or the feedback circuit, gave us a necessary amplification to cause the circuit to have a gain greater than one and make it oscillate. So it's the actual feedback circuit that gives us the gain, not the transistor. It's C2 that determines the amount of feedback and the amount of the voltage out that we have. And that's because if you think about this circuit, it's nothing more than a capacitive voltage divider from ground through C2 up through C1 and then into Vn base. So we have a complete circuit and let's look at these as reactances again. So let's make this one 10 ohms and this one 10 ohms. The voltage on the base has to be the sum of the voltage drops on 10 ohms and the voltage drop on 10 ohms. So we're going to these are going to be in phase with each other so they're going to just just, just sum together. So we would have XC1 plus XC2. The actual voltage out is based on just XC2. So this is the way we're going to get the gain calculation. So plugging the values in that we have, we're going to get 10 ohms plus 10 ohms divided by 10 ohms or a gain of 2. So exactly what we, we came up with for this circuit. So if these are equal values, both of these are, in this example, 100 picofarad and 100 picofarad. The gain is going to be 2. Well, what happens if I increase the value of C2? So if I make the value of C2 larger, so if I go from uh, 100 picofarad to 200 picofarad, the reactance is going to go down. So if I did that, so let's keep C1 the same, but then make this one go down to 5 ohms. And then I have 5 ohms again, so C2 is going to be my 5 ohms. Cross that out. And now you can see my gain is 3, but 
my reactants, or at the output, C2, which is where I'm actually going to measure everything, it's all parallel, I'm going to end up getting a smaller value because I have a lower reactance. So at the expense of getting more gain, I actually have a lower voltage out. And you can guess what will happen if I go in the other direction. If I make C2 uh, more reactive, so I put a, a smaller capacitor in there. And let's say I make it from 10, and in this, this time instead of... Uh, bring it down to 5, I bring it up to 20 ohms. So I've picked some capacitor whose reactance is going to give me 20 ohms. So now I have 20 ohms over 20 ohms. So now you can see I have 10 plus 20 divided by 20. My gain is now 1.5, so my gain for the feedback network has gone down, but this is now a larger reactance and I get a bigger voltage out. So there's definitely a trade-off between the two. To make sure that this oscillator will work, we have to make sure that the reactance of these two components is larger than the value for RE in this circuit. RE is not given on data sheets, but it occurs when we are at a effective impedance of a circuit between its resonant frequency and something called its anti-resonant frequency. So RE would be something like this in the circuit. Now this is not the same as the equivalent series resistance, but guess what? No data sheet will give you the value for RE in a crystal. So what we have to do is come up with something that will give us at least a worst case scenario and we can use the ESR. The crystals that I have are 4.096 megahertz and if I look at the data sheet for that, you can see that I'm not even given the ESR for this one. I'm given motional resistance, but that's not the same as ESR. So I had to do some really generalized research on the HC490s, and I came up with ESRs that ranged anywhere from 50 to 90 ohms. Now this is going to be a worst case scenario. RE is always going to be smaller than that. So what we want to make sure of is that these reactances are going to be bigger than the 90, and that helps us assure oscillation. So just plugging our values in uh, to get the XC value for this component, you'll remember it's just 1 over 2 pi FC, so 4.096 meg times the 82 picofarad, and I get 474 ohms. So I've got 474 for both of these. To get the actual resistance or reactance of this, it's going to be amplified by the transconductance value of 40.9 millisiemens that we got way back when. And the way we get that is XC1 times XC2 times that conductance value. So 474 times 474 times 40.9 milli. And we're going to end up with well over 9k of total reactants, about 9.2. So yeah, that's way above it, so we're good to go on, on that count. And finally, we have our capacitor here, and this is just a little trimmer pot. And what this will allow us to do is that any error that we might have in inductance or capacitance in the circuit, we can trim that out. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of XC to the XL in here, and we're going to adjust that frequency to where it's right on that value. So now we'll go ahead and take a look at the circuit put some power in it, kick the electrons, get them moving, and see if we can get this thing to come out at 4.096 megahertz. And if we can trim it out properly. And then we'll see about changing some of these values and bumping the voltage up or down and changing the gain. And here's our test circuit. So here's our 4124 capacitor. And this is RE, so 4.7K. Here's RB1, 
of 62K. RB2 of 82K. Our 282 uh, puff cap, C1, C2. And our 4.096 megahertz crystal. And the trimmer cap. So we should be able to trim this out to get exactly 40.096 megahertz here. And of course it's going to drift with, with time. And it's not going to be too bad. So these are, these are fairly accurate. Now I wouldn't recommend building this circuit, if you're going to use it for something seriously, don't build it on a breadboard because there are all kinds of parasitic capacitances that you have to deal with and inductances and crystal oscillators are just, you know, they're sensitive. They don't like that. So let's put some power on this and see how it works out. This is the output from our crystal oscillator and you can see that we don't have a, a beautiful sine wave in the circuit, which is typical. But you can see that we have a frequency of about 5 or 4.1 megahertz, so that's pretty good for 4.096. And if we measure the amplitude of our output, you can see that we have 3.32 volts. Yep, 3.3 volts. So that's pretty good. So what happens if I change my capacitor from an 82 picofarad to a 68 picofarad. Well, according to our numbers, what should happen is because 68 picofarad is smaller, its reactance is bigger, this, this should get larger, but I risk the chance of making the feedback so low that the circuit no longer oscillates. So I'm going to kill power for just a second. And we had 3.3 volts, so we'll remember that. And insert our new capacitor. Turn power back on. And you can see that our voltage has gone up just slightly. We're now at 3.9. And it's still oscillating, so we could really keep that capacitor in there if it didn't affect the, the loading on the crystal. So let's put the original one back into the circuit, and then we'll check out the frequency adjustment of our variable capacitor. And see if we can get it spot on. And you can see I have a frequency of 4.096167, so I'm pretty far off. So if I adjust this, and to, to make this adjustment I actually have to hold on to the cap, so that kind of throws everything off. And I went the wrong way because you can see that the frequency is more or worse off than it was before. And a little bit better there. And a little bit better still. And if I had some, some better caps than what I have, I should be able to get pretty close to... 4.096, so I went a little bit too far in the other direction, but you kind of see the point. By just tweaking the cap, I can get pretty pretty close. So a better cap definitely would have done the job, and actually it looks like we're getting really, really, really close. So 4.096, and well, that's about as good as I think we're going to get, so let's not... Let's not mess with it. <laughs> We're right on the money. So you can see the uh, the trimmer cap definitely did take some of the inductance out of the circuit. More of a, uh, an improved resonant circuit than what we had before. The frequency counter is showing us a frequency that's only about 8 tenths of a hertz above 4.096 meg. And I've made the adjustment to get that with everything hooked up so the circuit is completely loaded from the two probes for the oscilloscope, the channel 1 and channel 2, as well as the frequency counter. Of course, the frequency counter is going to do the biggest amount of loading because it has only a 50 ohm impedance. What I will see on the scope are my channel 1 and channel 2 outputs. The channel 1 output is the collector, so this is actually what we're what we're getting on the collector of our of our transistor so this is the actual output and you can see it's 
5.8, about 1.6. And this is the base. And you know that we're not going to get the same output on the base as on the emitter because this is a common collector. But this is the, the feedback signal in blue. And you can see that it is larger. It's not twice as large as our input signal. We're looking at 2.56, 2.58 versus 1.58. And that can be attributed to losses in the circuit having built it on a breadboard, etc. But we definitely have a sufficient amount of feedback or amplification from the feedback network to get the circuit to oscillate. Now, if I take channel 2 out of the equation and we look at channel 1 alone and I begin to adjust channel 1 and let me go ahead and take out the the function generator or the frequency counter as well and you can see the signal is going to pop up quite a bit because I've taken the loading out and I've also taken channel 2 or the base value out and you can see we have 4.56 4.6 when we were doing the original measurement for the frequency on the scope we had a lower amplitude and that's because the trimmer cap wasn't set to eliminate any excess inductance the circuit wasn't completely balanced yet and if I change that trimmer cap value I'm just gonna crank on it pretty well you can see now that the frequency or the amplitude has gone way down and that's because that trimmer cap is out of balance and let me go in the other direction and well we're just about up in the other direction as far as we can get so it's 4.2 and now I've pretty much completely washed out the inductance and there's our signal again so by adjusting that trimmer cap I actually will make the output larger you'll get the biggest signal when the crystal and the two capacitors are perfectly balanced at the resonant frequency this is the test circuit that was developed by G3 PTO and it was created so that when you have a, a bunch of crystals and they're not marked and some aren't you can at least discover what their what their oscillating frequency is supposed to be and the output here is not going to be spot on so if you had that 4000 or 4.096 megahertz crystal like we had previously you're not going to get 4.096 you're going to get 4.1 or 4.0 something it's going to be pretty far off and again if it was 10 megahertz it's not going to be 10 megahertz at the output it might be 9.9 .9 something or or 10.1 or some such thing so it's going to be pretty close the, the circuit consists of two emitter followers, so we have a, a buffer followed by another buffer, so this is to prevent circuit loading, and it really has to be done this way because when you're using a, just any crystal to stick it in here and to see if it works, you, you really have to minimize the loading as much as you can. You'll also notice that there is a resistor in the path, and I think he had a 10 ohm resistor or 20 ohm resistor. I just had 56. And that resistor is there to prevent the transistors from getting uh, too hot, and it also makes the circuit use a little bit less energy. So any changes in temperature can be absorbed by that resistor, and it, it just helps the stability. It's there as a protection factor, and that's all it does. So it's still a common... Uh, a common collector or an emitter follower even though there's a resistor up here it's just there to help dissipate some of the heat and keep the transistors from going going into heaven after the smoke comes out of them so you can see it's pretty much biased in the center of the load line and he also he said this could be used from voltage from uh, 9 volts up to 15 volts so we'll go ahead and, and test a few of these out and see how it works I should mention that the circuit was designed to test crystals from 2 megahertz all the way up to 25 megahertz and I'll put in a 1 megahertz crystal and see if it works and I'll put a few of the others in that I have just to see that it does operate as well so the circuit itself has already been built and so there that there it is and zoom in a little bit and you can see my transistors and these are 3904s if I'm not mistaken yep 3904s and our two 10k ohm resistors and these are our caps and that'll be of course the area where we put our our crystals in and this is our coupling and the, that resistor there is just to make sure that the that the current isn't 
so excessive that it causes this uh, transistor to saturate. And let's fire it up and put a couple of crystals in there and see what we get. All right, the first crystal I'll try is, I don't know if you can see that, um, probably not. There it is, 6 megahertz. And we'll attach it. And there it is, so we're looking at about, about 6 megahertz, so that's pretty good, though. There. I'll try a 12 megahertz crystal next, so we're just going to double the frequency. And you can see how the amplitude has changed quite a bit. And bump that up, get it to trigger properly. And you can see we've got about 12 megahertz, so that one works pretty well. I have a 1 megahertz crystal now, and that one is not supposed to work from the design criteria. And, well, there's something happening, but I think it's more noise than anything else. Yep, that's just noise, so we're getting absolutely nothing with 1 megahertz. And then I have a 3. Point five seven nine five four five and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's hard to see so this is the old color burst for television and take that down a little bit and it's 3.6 so there you go it's a pretty good little test jig if you ever need to come up with the the frequencies for some unknown crystals of course it still leaves you with a lot of other unknowns like a it's ESR and what RE is and shunt capacitances and such. The next video is going to cover the topic of decibels and logarithms a little bit. This was a request from, from a viewer. And I also had a request to do something on the 555 and PLLs. And PLLs, that's a pretty good topic, but I have to admit to a certain dislike for the 555. It's, it's just a... It's a, it's a great hobby circuit, but for anything that requires accuracy, I would definitely use something else. But I, I'll still try to tackle something along those lines, because if you're just experimenting, they work great. Well, once again, I thank you for watching the video and taking time out of your day to do so. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, give us a thumbs up. And if you didn't, well, don't give us a thumbs down, but give us some criticism, and we'll try to fix it. Uh, in the next video. We can't make everybody happy, but we try to make a good product anyways. So thank you for watching, and until next time.